Welcome to the Minnesota Rovers Tuesday evening presentation. Minnesota Rovers is an outdoors club based in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Our members organize trips that range from one hour to two weeks in Minnesota or further afield. Examples of our activities include hiking, biking, backpacking, skiing, snowshoeing, paddling, and rock climbing. We also organize conservation and trail clearing trips. Our members have experience and skills in many outdoor activities, so if you want to learn a new outdoor activity, we can probably help you. For more information, go to mnrovers.org. Now let's move on to this week's presentation. You're here tonight to hear about the Grand Canyon. Our presenters tonight are, are Barry and Jen, and they've both been rovers for over 15 years. Um, <clears throat> and they've also spent a majority of those years on the rover board in multiple positions. They've both given a lot back to the club. They enjoy camping, cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, hiking, kayaking, and playing pickleball. Um, they've spent time in national parks in Arizona and Utah and have done multiple trips to different parts of the Grand Canyon. And I think in the last year, they hit every state park in Minnesota. So please welcome tonight's speakers, Jen and Barry. Okay, so let's get started. So we're going to talk about a hiking and camping trip in the Grand Canyon from rim to rim. We did it a number of years ago, and we did it on October 11 to 15. And this we find is a good time because it's not hot like the middle of summer, but it hasn't, it's not snowing yet normally. Typically, typically yeah. Um, and we went actually the day that it, the, the facilities at the North Rim closed because um, they closed the restaurant and stuff at, uh, on October 11th, I think it was, sometime around then. To get to the Grand Canyon, uh, there's a couple of ways we normally, or one way we normally go, and that's to go to Phoenix, and it's three and a half hours from there. My sister lives in Phoenix, so that's uh, very useful for us. Or you can go to Vegas, which might be cheaper, and it's four hours from there. And possibly you could fly in the Flagstaff, or there is an airport by the Grand Canyon, but I've never investigated that because I'm sure it's expensive, and you're probably on a scary little plane. So I'd go into Phoenix. That would be my way to do it. So... So when you do the rim to rim, you do it on the on the corridor trail, the corridor trails. And as you can see them here, the Grand Canyon is actually 277 miles long, but most of the action happens right in this area. And most of it actually happens on the south rim. Most people go to the south rim, they don't go down into the canyon, but then some people go down to the canyon, some go to the north. So we did rim to rim from the north rim uh, to the south rim. And by the way, if you've got questions, if you could put them in the chat and we'll get to them along the way or we'll get, we'll get to them at the end. So I have a cross-sectional view through the canyon, which I think is kind of useful. So the north, the north rim is about 1,000 feet higher than the south rim. So it's easier to go from the north rim to the south rim so you don't have to uh, hike up so far. So we started at the north rim, then we went to Cottonwood Campground, then to Bright Angel, and then uh, up to Indian Garden, it used to be called, and now it's Havasupai Gardens, and then uh, up to the South Rim. So just a little bit on logistics and cost. Right now, a backcountry permit for two people, three sites is $100. I updated these figures from what they were when, when we went. Uh, North Rim camping is only 18, which is a pretty good deal. Uh, car rental is probably, for a week, is probably going to cost you around 500 or more, depending on what kind of deal you can get. Same with airlines, probably 400 to Phoenix each, uh, unless you can get a better deal. Grand Canyon shuttle is $120 to, to get a shuttle from the South Rim to the North Rim. That saves you having to have two rental cars. Grand Canyon entry fee, $35, unless you got the Giza Pass or something where you can uh, buy one pass and get in for free after that. So total for two people is $1,700 which is quite a lot of money, but this is a bucket list type trip for a lot of people. So, you know, a lot of people think it's uh, it's worth it, even though it's that much money and you're staying in a tent. But uh, Backcountry permit. So the hardest part of the whole trip is to get the backcountry permit. They do a lottery system and you have to enter the lottery five months before you want to go. And so up to this year, you had to send a letter or a fax five months before and they would gather them all up for that month that came in 
then they'd shuffle them and then they'd start picking them out. And you had to put alternative campsites and alternative dates. Well, this year or next year, they're going to change it. It's going to be online. But now you won't be putting in to get campsites and different dates. What you'll be doing, you'll just say, so if you wanted to go next October, um, on May 16th, you've got to put in to get into the lottery. And then you've got until the lottery closes on June 1st, if you see this little chart here. So then they'd notify you on June 2nd if you won the lottery. So then you just win the lottery to actually book the campsite. It's $10 to get in the lottery. If you win, that goes towards a permit. If you lose, you lose your $10. And I found this online. I don't know how true it is, but it's probably true. The 75% of people fail to get the permits that they want. Also, when you're looking at this, if you have a group size of one to six, you can get a regular campground. If you have seven to 11 people, you need to go into group camps and there's a lot less group camps. So it's easier if you've got six people or less. And don't try to, you know, go in two groups and then meet up somewhere because if the park catches you, they'll they'll take your permit away. Um, they don't define how many tents you can have at a site, but you could probably fit three uh, three small tents on a on a on a single site. Uh, this is the way we do our backpacking. We get a spreadsheet and we put all the stuff on the spreadsheet. And we put the weights. And then I can look at that and see, okay, that's the way to mine. And I can see if I can offload more stuff to Jen. So my pack's not so heavy. And then you can think of some things. Maybe I'm not even going to take it because it's too heavy. Or maybe I'm going to go to REI and buy something lighter. So, And we tend to try to get around to 25 pounds is what we've done, which for a lot of people is pretty light. But for me, that's that's heavy enough. And here's, here's our gear that we had on this particular trip. Or uh, I think most of it's there. Uh... And here's the weight of the pack, 25 pounds. We weighed it at the backcountry office. And of course, it gets lighter as you eat more food. So that's good. But I'm not sure whether there was water in here. So one thing with the water on the corridor trails is different uh, water spigots along the way. So you could probably just go with a one liter water bottle and fill it up on the way. But we normally take two bottles because sometimes you might want to have more water. And this is in October. If you were there in the middle of summer, you'd want way more water. And I would not go in the middle of summer for that reason. It gets too darn hot. So we were heading to the Grand Canyon from Phoenix. Um, this is the entry point of the Grand Canyon and South Rim. It looks like it's really busy, and it was, but the, the lines move pretty quickly. They have a line over here where just the RVs go. Um, at the National Park, there's these spring water spigots to that you can fill your water bottle on. So they don't sell bottled water there, which is great. This was the, we were waiting for the shuttle. So we um, decided to take a groupie. And you can see from here, you can see the North Rim and also, the first time I went to the Grand Canyon, I didn't realize there's a canyon within the canyon. And here is the, the drop off here again. So it's pretty cool. So we took the shuttle across to the North Rim. Um, they put our bags up on the top of the vehicle. We probably had about 10 people in the van. Um, our driver had been driving for over 40 years. He's done a ton of trips. He was actually kind of a crazy driver. Once we got to the North Rim, I was like, okay, I hope we make it there. Um, we met a couple that was, were living in California, but originally they were from Hungary. So they had the same itinerary as we did. So it was kind of nice to connect with them. And it's a four and a half hour drive to the North Rim from the South with two like 10 minute breaks along the way. And just the scenery is just awesome around there. First part, we're crossing the Colorado. We're heading into the North Rim now. You can see that there had been a fire previous years, probably one or two years prior. And this is a kaibab squirrel. We saw these. We saw something and it's like, what the heck is that? Because the tail is so interesting. It kind of seemed like ghost-like, but 
And then this is from the north, north rim to the south rim that we're looking towards. And we have to have a token sunset picture. Okay. So our first uh, day on the hike was from the north rim uh, down to the Cottonwood Campground. And this was a 6.8 mile hike. And it's mainly downhill, which makes it easier. So there's our campsite at the North Rim. It was actually colder than we thought it was going to be. It was in the upper 30s. And we had this great idea that we were going to buy fleeces from a thrift store and we'll wear them at the North Rim and then throw them away so we didn't have to carry them the whole way. But we ended up keeping them. And we also found a, a small sleeping bag in the dumpster, which we took too, which was good because it was quite cold in the canyon. Of course, in the canyon, it's lower down. It's warmer than the rim. But even then, the, the canyon was pretty cold, colder than... I expected. So there we are with our new Hungarian friends setting up on the trail, but they had bigger packs and they were a lot slower hikers from us than us. So we didn't hike with them at all. We overtake them and then we'd see them later. So there's the Kaibab trail. You have to, you don't go just right over the rim from the North rim. You go, have to go inland a little bit and then you go down a, a river valley, which you'll see in a minute, in, in a minute. So here's the start of the trail. It's really exciting when you're starting the hike and you're going down into the Grand Canyon and you know, know you got a bunch of miles to go down, down into the canyon. And here's just some of the views along the, along the trail. We're with our buddies for a little while. So this is interesting. This is a view across to the San Francisco mountains by Flagstaff. And that, the highest peak in Arizona is right around here. And that's Mount Humphreys. Humphreys which is 12,600 feet. And I hiked that a number of years back. And I, once I got up there, I, I knew I could see the South Rim because you, uh, the North Rim, you can see the North Rim over here. And it's uh, 55 miles away that you can look across there. Uh, a little bit of up and down on the way from the North Rim, but mainly down. Uh, I like geology. So if you like geology, the Grand Canyon's a great place. And there's a few signs along the way. So you can geek out on the geology of the place, which is cool. Uh, you can ride a mule halfway down from the North Rim and then back up. From the South Rim, you can take a mule all the way to the bottom. Personally, I wouldn't want to because they that you're pretty high up on a mule and they they walk right near the edge. So I'd rather hike it than uh, go on a mule, personally. It's a Supai Tunnel on the way down. Here you can see, if you can see here the trail, you can watch it snaking around ahead of you. So it's kind of cool to be able to see the trail and think, okay, that's where I'm going to be in a couple of hours or an hour or so. Be way down there. Uh, finally, we got into the main canyon. So then looking back, you can see the white rocks of the North Rim. Uh, and the lodge is up, or the visitor center is up here somewhere that we went to the night before and had, uh, had dinner. Uh, nice red of probably sandstone, I would think, with that color. Again, you can see more of the trail going down. We crossed the, uh, the creek a few times on the way. The trail gets a little skinny here, but it was never scary to us. Um, so some people, maybe it would be, but it's not that. It's not that narrow. It's pretty good. And then partway down, you get to Roaring Springs, which is this Roaring Spring here. And they actually pipe the water from here up to the South Rim. So on a lot of the trail, you're actually walking along the pipeline and you can see the pipeline under the trail. So the Manzana, Manzanita rest area is partway down. They've got a nice composting toilet, which is better than the other alternatives. So we met this, uh, this woman there. She was actually on the phone. She was calling the park service because she cut her leg. She'd bound it up and it wasn't bleeding everywhere, but she, I think she thought they were going to come and get her and take her out, but they told her, no, they're not going to do that. She also had a nine-year-old son with her. So what they actually told her to do was go back up the North Rim but then I talked to her afterwards and I actually said, no, I don't think that's a good idea because she had a bed reserved down at the uh, Phantom Ranch. I said, why don't you go down to Phantom Ranch? You can get your wound dressed. You can stay there overnight. And she was kind of freaked out. But the thought of her going back up the North Rim with a nine-year-old son, just the two of them, in the sun, all the way uphill, I don't, and when she's all freaked out, I don't think that would have been good. I think the Park Service said that because their um, policy is if someone's hurt, don't go deeper in the canyon, go up. But I don't think it would have been a good idea. And I spoke to a ranger later and I, I think I think she was OK in the end. And we offered to walk down Phantom Ranch with her, but luckily she turned us down because that would have been a long hike there and back. 
So now we're at the Cottonwood Campground. Number six was our campsite. Here you can see the campsite. So you could probably get a few little tents in there. There's an ammo box that you, they tell you to put your food in so you don't get the critters eating it. You can hang your pack up there. And then we've got some shade. There's actually some trees. It's pretty neat down in the canyon. You're, it's pretty much desert, but wherever there's water, wherever you get a creek, then you get trees and shrubs and you get a lot of foliage. So there's our tent almost hidden there. So what we did on these hikes is we'd get to the campsite probably at lunchtime or before. So then we'd get in the shade, we'd sit there, relax, read our Kindles, cool off, and then we'd take a side hike later in the day. So the, this day's side hike was to Ribbon Falls, which is uh, kind of nice. Oh, there's an agave along the way, which they used to make tequila. Uh, so we're on our way to Ribbon Falls, and there you can see the falls coming down the rocks. It's really pretty. And in this one, I think you can see a person up there, so it's pretty tall. And as you can see, there's a lot of foliage around that. And you can actually get behind the falls and actually look through them, which is pretty neat. And there you can see all the, it's like a little mini rainforest right by the falls. Oh, so as far as eating, um, I've, um, I've perfected it a little more now, but I make uh, homemade power bars. So we normally eat those for breakfast and lunch just to keep things simple. And then the other thing I've done, which probably a lot of people won't like, but I like it, is I make tofu jerky. And it's amazing when you dehydrate tofu, how chewy it gets. And you put some flavoring with it, and it gives you something nice to chew along the way. And then in the evening, we had red wine and a dried meal. So in that case, we got pad thai and mountain chili. So, so we had some nice meals along the way. And we took these flasks that we could put some red wine in. So as we went along, the pack was getting lighter. Oh, so this is just to remind me to tell you, if you haven't been down in the canyon at night, it gets really dark. You can see the stars really well. If the if you get a full moon, we had that one time, and it's like mm -hmm. someone shining that car headlights into your tent. It's so bright. So it's, it's really neat. So the next day, we were taking off from Cottonwood and heading to Bright Angel. It was a 7.2-mile hike day. Um, it is all downhill we're going to head into a box canyon um so the previous night we saw this bright light up where we thought the north rim was and it turns out that that we figured it might be the north rim visitor center so we zoomed in our cameras and and you can just start seeing that there's a building there and here's a better picture but it's really zoomed in um, so that was kind of cool seeing where we came from. And so we started at the campground here. Here's the visitor center. We hiked to the North Kaibab Trail up here, which is about a mile, and kind of came down. And it gets down to the Cottonwood Campground down here. Um, our buddies were hiking early as well. And I this is kind of overexposed, but the trail here is pretty sandy and dirty as opposed to the rocky trail that we've also been on more. <clears throat> and we're heading into the Box Canyon. You can tell that there's water to our right because that's it's where the green foliage is. But the the rocks are just amazing down here and it's beautiful. I just don't want to be there during a flash flood. Again, the trail gets kind of narrow, but it was never an issue. And if it rained or, or just rained slightly, this would be a good spot to maybe hide from the rain. Um, there was this man-made bridge. You can tell that this is an older bit and this was newly. I don't know if it was replacing an old bit that broke or what, but and then there's some prickly pear cactuses that we saw along the way. Um, Barry found one of these, I don't know if it's fruit or a flower, along the trail. So he decided to pick it up because obviously you can see the big spines. Well it turns out there's little spines too. <laughs> so he had to use his multi-tool to get the little spines out of his fingers. Uh, we're getting to the Bright Angel Camp. 
We're going to be get, passing through Phantom Ranch first. And again, it gets really green where there's campsites and water. Um, lots of cactus around there, though. And then there was the sign trail courtesy practices. It's, it's actually really good rules. You know, don't travel alone. Use the restrooms. Mules have the right of way. Uphill travelers have the right of way. Um, and pack out your trash. Oh, I should mention, um, when we were at these campsites, I mean, it was, we were kind of worried about people playing games in the tents and stuff, but everyone was so tired from the hiking that they were like out like a light at like nine or earlier. So it was very peaceful at the campsites. Um, we got to the, this is a bright angel campground. Can see a few people soaking their feet in the water. It was definitely very refreshing. There's a whole bunch of campsites here, some along the creek and then some kind of off in the back. We checked out all the campsites and someone recommended a campsite. So we ended up going there and it was kind of off the beaten path, kind of by the rock. Um, here's the pipes that we hang our backpacks on. And the reason we do that is <clears throat> these critters are planning their attack. Where is the food? There's always on the corridor trails, there are the ammo boxes on every, at every campsite. Um, so we utilize them for our food. Um, yeah, so these guys are very sneaky. We unpacked, we set up the tent, and then we were going to go for a side hike and decided we'd see if they wanted to go with. They're still doing their lunch and they brought a full backgammon board on the trip. Now, we could have just made a copy and brought the chips, but nope, they wanted to have the board. <laughs> they were very heavily loaded down with their packs. So they came up hiking with us on the side hike. So we started at Bright Angel Campground and we just did kind of a lasso um, clockwise. We were right by some cliffs, so you just kind of keep walking. We never saw a rock fall, but you just don't want to get hit either. Here's a here's the Colorado. It's pretty brown at this time of the year, and this was a good spot for rafts to come in and just have lunch, take a break. Um, I think it's a popular spot for them to stop. And then we're going to cross the Black Bridge. Um, it started in 1907 where the first person built a cable car large enough for a mule to cross. And then the current bridge is a rigid suspension bridge that was built in 1928. They have these wooden planks on the bottom because mules do come across here and they don't want they'd rather replace the planks than the bridge plus it's probably better for the the feet on the hooves you'll at the very end there's a little cave that you go through to continue hiking along this trail you can see the the river and the far bridge down here that's the silver bridge that we're going to be going across soon and there is the Bright Angel campground that we were just at, or we were just coming from. Um, you will see mules along the trail. There's two groups of them with the drivers. And the rule is, you, if you don't know an obvious spot to stand, ask the first driver where you should stand to be out of the way. As you can see, Barry is right here standing on the inside of the trail which prevents him from falling off of the trail. <laughs> um, the, the river was pretty fast here and you can see that the, the boats were kind of going down sideways and backwards. Um, there's also some kayakers here, which I'm presuming are the guides trying to tell them where to, where to go. 
to be safe. Here's the silver bridge, and this one does not have the wooden planks on the bottom because mules don't go across here. Some people are kind of weary crossing this because they can see basically underneath the bridge. It's, it's a little bit more scary than the black bridge. And then later on, we did a hike to the Clear Creek Trail. Um, so here's the Bright Angel Campground. We headed back through Phantom Ranch and then went up. Um, it's a trail that you can camp on if you needed to, um, or if you planned to go that way, but you can't do it for two miles from here. Um, there's some pretty big rocks that obviously have fallen. And you can see the trail going up and it's a pretty steep trail, especially after hiking so much that day. And then we're hiking up and you can see this is the Bright Angel Campground and Phantom Ranch. And it's just some beautiful views up here. This is a South Kaibab Trail that we've come down before. It's a pretty steep trail from the South Rim down to the river. It's quicker to go this way than the Bright Angel Trail, um, but it would be very rough going up. Um, and when we're coming down that trail back to our campsite, we looked up and sure enough, you can see the North Rim Visitor Center. So this is like from eight miles away. It is zoomed in, so. Okay, so day three from was from the Bright Angel Campground that's down by the river up to Havasupai Gardens, as it is called now. This was 4.6 miles, but of course it was uphill. Uh, we crossed the bridge early in the morning and we're on our way. You can see you can go one direction to the Bright Angel Trail and one to the South Kaibab Trail. South Kaibab's good to come down, as Jen said, because it's steep and you can get down quick, but it's harder to go up. So Bright Angel's better to go up. There were some palm trees down there, which are quite unusual in the in the Grand Canyon. I don't know whether they're native there, but you don't see those that often. And here's the trail. If you go, if you start early in the morning, you get some nice shade, so it's nice and cool starting off. And you're in the shade a lot of the way up to the up this side towards the South Rim. Uh, and there was some. I'm assuming they were Mennonite women, and they looked a little little out of place there, but they seemed to be enjoying their hike uh, down down and from the rim and back up. There's some of the trail on the way. Again, you got a lot of foliage where there's water. And then we're getting up to Indian Garden, as it used to be called. And here, there's a, a raven is another guy you got to watch out for because they'll grab your food as well if you get a chance. And Jen was talking about the squirrels. I've had two packs chewed through in the Grand Canyon by, by squirrels because one time I didn't realize there was nuts in there, and the other time I left them for a minute, and then I got chatting, and the squirrel chewed through the pack. So they're uh, little varmints. So you can see all the foliage. So at uh, Havasupai Gardens, there's some big trees there. And this campsite is really beautiful because you get there, you've got this this uh, shelter, so you can get out of the sun, get in the shade, you can hang your packs up, and you can see how big this campsite is too, from the shelter out to the to the tent. So you could get a few tents in here. And there's my stove just there. Oh, there's my little case for the stove. You'll see that again in a minute. So Jen, Jen was having a rest there and reading a Kindle. And then I went for a side hike along the Tonto Plateau. So this is instead of going down in or up or down into the canyon, this is along the plateau. So it's fairly level, but not completely. But it's totally out in the sun. There's no shade at all out here. And then I went to Horn Creek, which is this small campsite. And they say there that you shouldn't drink the water, even if you could filter enough water out of here. There's not a lot anyway. But the reason is there's a uranium mine up on the rim. So they, they say not to drink this because it's radioactive. But we met some geologists down in there, and they said they tested the water, and they thought it, the levels were fine. And I'm like, okay, as long as you think that, I'm not drinking it. So, But anyway, and this is why the creek goes up to the, up to the rim up there. 
And then that evening we did a, another side hike as it was as the sun was going down to Plateau Point. And Plateau Point is a, a mile and a half from the uh, Havasupai Gardens. And you can go out there. It's nice to go out there when the sun's going down and you can go out to the end here and look down on the river. And we could also look down on the trail that we came up earlier. You can see the trail there on the river. I actually first did that as a day hike too from the rim to Plateau Point and back up. Takes you, I don't know, half a day. So there we are out on Plateau Point. We actually forgot our flashlight and on our way back, you can see here we're on our way back to Havasupai Gardens where all the trees are. Well, by the time we got back there, it was pitch black and we heard some noise in the campsite. We weren't sure what it was at first and then we got our headlights and then we could see there was mule deer in the, in the site. So when you get the water, you get the foliage and then you also get the animals too because there's something for them to eat. And then I just threw this in to remind me a little later we heard a noise and we thought it was a deer and we looked behind us and there was a, a skunk just trotting past our campsite. And then in the morning, there was a bit of a scent of skunk in the, in the campsite. So there's a lot of critters down there, including this is, a, I think, an interesting story. We were there another time and we saw a, couple, a, a rat running around. And then in the middle of the night, we would put our food in the ammo box, but we hadn't put everything in the ammo box. And we heard a sound that sounded like, like sunglasses being dragged off a picnic bench, which is exactly what it was. A pack rat, or otherwise known as trading rat, had stolen Jen's sunglasses. So I got up in the night and I tried to find its nest. And its nest was in the sawgrass, which is really sharp. I actually cut my finger on it. And that protects them from predators. But they'll take shiny objects. And I found all these things in its nest. And this was my shovel, my multi-tool. This is the same container as I had for my stove, but it wasn't mine. There was a glove and there was someone's spoon in there. But we never did find the sunglasses because they probably got stuck. All the rats still running around wearing the sunglasses. I don't know. But they call them trading rats because often if they pick up one thing and they see something that's shiny, they like, they'll drop the thing they have and they'll pick up the other thing. And they can actually look at their nests or middens, they call, and some of them are hundreds of years old. And they can look to see what's in there so they know what was growing around there at the time. And they can even, depending on the size of the rat poop, they can figure out how big the rats are, which is inversely proportional to the temperature at the time. So they can do climate studies using these, uh, these middens, which I looked up later. But I told the park about it and they didn't believe me. They said, you sure it wasn't a squirrel? It's like, no, it wasn't a squirrel. Squirrels don't go out at night. We saw the rat. So, and then I looked it up later. And I don't, I'm surprised they didn't know it was that. So one other critter here that's interesting, it's called a darkling beetle, AKA a stink beetle. And whenever you see these, they put their head down, they stick their butt up and they'll squirt a noxious smelly substance from their butts, which I thought was kind of funny. Mm -hmm. So day four, we went from Havasupai Gardens to the South Rim. It was 4.9 miles up. Um, we started at 6.08 a.m. and it was dark, but we, we, um, it was a good hike. It was, it's, it's fairly easy of a hike right after Havasupai Gardens. It's not that steep, um, but after a while it does get a bit steeper. And I'm just kind of taking pictures. You can see the trail, you can see Plateau Point where here, so here's the campground. And then we've done some switchbacks up. Uh, we at one point were trying to figure out if our friends had started out. And this was a very um, focused picture. It was zoomed in quite a bit. They were They weren't too far behind us, but... They were taking it slow. Um, here's a bunch of switchbacks on the way up to the south rim. Um, you can see the little people, and you're like, where does this trail go? Are we going to have to rock climb or something? But we, we figured that we'll be able to make it up to the south rim. And we're almost up there. You can still see Plateau Point Trail. And I mean, most of the trail is, is very, you know, 
obvious where the trail is. There's some steps along the way. Um, I think we're at this point about at the top of the switchbacks that we saw. And we are at the top. We finished. Um, and then we waited around for a bit. I heard there was a good ice cream shop that I should check out, but it didn't open for a while. We started out too early. <laughs> so we waited for our friends from Hungary and they made it up as well. Um, so from north to south rim is 23 and a half miles. Um, I had a Fitbit on and I'm not sure if that is just the 23 and a half miles, just over 73,000 steps, or if it's the total miles hike, the 41.8 because of the side hikes. It was, it was a fun trip and just really enjoyed it. When we got back to the backcountry permit, um, our Hungarian friends realized that they had a really flat tire. So we we're trying to figure out where to put the jack underneath their vehicle so it doesn't wreck the vehicle. Um, they eventually got it changed and took off. And these are the creatures we saw. We saw a bunch of lizards and a spider along the way. And a heart cactus. <laughs> Um, I do know that we have some questions as far as hiking downhill, how hard is, is it on the knees? We don't, we don't use the poles, um, but some people do and swear by the poles. So, I mean, it is, if you, there's no reason why not to have the poles. There's some, also some Creek crossings that might help if you have poles. It, it's, I, I didn't find it that bad, but some people also, they run from rim to rim. And that I think would be really hard on the knees if you ran all the way down those rocky trails. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. What section of the trip? Um, oh, hold on. Uh, we didn't download any maps to the Kindles. We really didn't need maps on the main, on the main trails. I don't know that we even had a map. Mm -mm. I don't know. I don't think we did. Um, yeah, always carry a Geiger counter. That's a good, that's a good idea. But it was interesting, the geologist we talked to, the guy that was saying the water's fine was, I think, like 60 years old. But they had a 15-year-old kid with him. And it's like, well, it might be okay for a 60-year-old, but I don't know about the 15-year-old. Oh, good questions here. Um, what section of the trip had the coldest temperatures at night? Definitely up on the North Rim because it's higher. And that was upper 30s. But down in the canyon, I mean, certainly it's during the day, it was trail. probably 70 degrees down mm -hmm. in the canyon but cooler at night. Yeah, it was definitely pretty cool when we had we were at the Bright Angel campground. No snakes. So I've been in the canyon about 10 times, and most of those, or a lot of those with Jen, we have seen one mm -hmm. snake the whole time, and it was a king snake. So, and that was in uh, Havasupai. Oh. So uh, we didn't do any bouldering, no. Uh, is there water often or were the sources far apart? So what we did was there was water at every campsite and we each had two liters of water. Um, so we could fill up our water bottles at the campsites to use for our dehydrate, to hydrate our food. And we just have the water from campsite to campsite. We didn't, we had a filter for a backup, but we never used it. Well, on that, <clears throat> Oh, that rest area, like where that woman had cut a, we met that woman who'd cut a leg. There's rest areas in between the campsites too with water. You've just got to make sure if you go in the winter um, or you're going to make sure for some reason the pipe hasn't burst or something, but normally there's there's plenty of water. <clears throat> How many um, shoe types? We had a camp shoe. So like I had Crocs that I used around the camp, but as far as hiking i just had a hiking shoe i had flip-flops if you see on that thing and they were horrible even, even in camp with with rocks in there so now i'd use crocs but crocs were a little heavier than flip-flops <laughs> um any other questions that anyone wants to ask or put in the chat oh yeah 
Oh, I've used tape. Yeah, tape to remove small cactus spines. Yeah, that would be a good idea. We didn't have any tape, though. I had a multi-tool. I didn't have I any had, tape. I had duct tape, but I, I had given some my duct tape because I usually put it around my heels for blisters. I don't do that anymore. But um, I used some of my duct tape, gave to the woman who was wanting some more for her wound. And in my defense for being so stupid, I did pick up the flower. I didn't realize there was these tiny little spines on it. They're not as obvious as the spines on the on the uh, other one. I don't think we took gloves. I don't think so. No. We just, it was amazing because when Barry found the lightweight sleeping bag in the, at the, the north rim at the campground, he also, there was an, also an accordion sleeping pad too that we didn't take, but the sleeping bag was so light. It was easy just to put on one of our bags and didn't add any much weight. So the weight of our packs was about 25 pounds. Um, how many days? So we're on the North Rim, one day to Cottonwood, one day to the river, one day to Havasupai Gardens and the next day out. So it's a total of four days. Four days hiking, yeah. A lot of people do it like in a day. They'll do rim to rim in a day, which you could do. But why would you want to? It's much better to spend more time there, be there at night, be there during the day, do side hikes. So we took our time, but a lot of people don't do that. They They go rim to rim in one day. And one of the rules that the park service has is you cannot store food in the campground if you aren't camping there. So if you're camping there, you can have a campsite and put food in the ammo boxes. But if you're doing a rim to rim or rim to rim to rim, you can't find an ammo box that's empty and put your food in for later. The, the rangers will come and yeah we it. saw the ranger going around taking food out of the ammo boxes of rim to rim to rim runners and put in there yeah so the altitude on the north rim it was about 8400 yeah and the south rim was about a thousand less than the north rim and at the river it's just over 2000 so it's still higher than we are in minnesota but I, I only have a problem at like seven, 8,000 feet if I start running or running upstairs. So if you're just walking, it doesn't bother me. It's not high enough to be a big problem. Uh, we actually did try and get some permits for this October, um, but we were unable to get um, the permits. So we weren't able to go and take rovers with us so we we tried um it's very popular right now after you know since covid it's just like it's what he read today was 75 percent of people can't get the permits they want but now with a new system it's interesting because if you apply for the lottery to be able to get a campsite you could apply for the lottery and then if you get it you could then I think, post a trip and get people to be on the trip. And then you could figure out how many you have and get the campsite accordingly. But mm -hmm. you'd have to time it right. Um, it, it is. So it's $10 for a permit for the group. So if there's six people, it's $10 for the permit. But if all of those six people went in for the lottery, they would each have to sp spend $10 for the lottery. So you could have a group of six people and all of you could apply for the lottery, but then only one of you could get the permit for the group of six. So it's, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you could, you could do it. I mean, if you, if you did six, your chance of getting the, winning the lottery is six times more, but then if you only use one permit, you're going to be out an extra $50. So. And if everyone did six permits, it's, it's the same percentage that you'd be going up against probably. Yeah. Um, we we rented a car from Phoenix, or transportation. We rented a car from Phoenix because he has a sister in Phoenix. Drove three and a half hours to the South Rim. We parked the rental car for four days, and we took the shuttle over to the North Rim, which was, back then it was $93, but right now I think it's a 130 per person. It's a four and a half hour drive to the North Rim and they drop you off and and off you go. Yeah, so the, you, you're paying for a rental car that's basically sitting there for four, four days, but. 
Um, we did we run into solo hikers? Probably. We really didn't talk to a lot of people. Yeah. So another, t I was talking about people doing rim to rim. Another time, I was down in the canyon and with my brother-in-law, we were camping at Bright Angel. We ran into a woman who'd been with a group of hikers doing rim to rim, and she was going slow because she had a medical issue that she'd had before she went down there, which is kind of stupid. And they'd left her behind. And she was walking towards the North Rim. She was trying to get up the North Rim in time for a dinner, a dinner reservation. And I, I, I bet she wouldn't have got up there that night. She was going so slow and she had a long way to go. But I don't know. I don't know what happened to her. But I'm, I'm sure she survived. But I don't know that she got up there in time for dinner or at all. I don't know. I was... That was pretty crazy. Yeah. Oh, the woman that we ran into that was injured, um, her husband dropped her off, her and her son off. So they were doing the trail and he was driving around to the South Rim. So if she would have gone up to the North Rim, they would have had to try and get a hold of her husband. And I don't think there's a lot of coverage up there. So it might have been very difficult, but. So someone says there's a shuttle you can take from Phoenix or Flagstaff. That's good. I didn't know that. But yeah, and then you've got to take it back. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's, there's a lot of different options. Or if you had a bigger group, you could have two rental cars. Um yeah, any any other questions? Kind of prep. Um I don't know that we prepped. Well, we, we do quite a bit of hiking. Yeah. We didn't do any special hiking, but we do quite a bit of hiking anyway. But it is a lot of people get caught out on the Grand Canyon because they think like we we have hiked from the rim to the river to the rim. And it took a whole day. And they tell you there's a lot of signs up telling you not to do that. But we did it in winter when it was pretty it was quite cold. Um, so it wasn't so bad. But a lot of people get in trouble doing that because they start walking down. It's so easy to walk down and then they turn around and they got all the way back up to go and it, it's tough. So they do have to, they do have to help people out of there quite, quite often. Yeah. Um, we, let's see how cell service. Um, we had some, you had more cell service than me with AT&T, but there was occasional that we'll get some cell service down there, but it's not, there's not, it's much. not very much. Even using a GPS is hard down there because of the slot canyons. Yeah, it's 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 unfortunate that you know the hardest part of it is getting the permit. I mean, you got to apply for the permit and then worry about the rest of the trip if you get the permit, right? Because if you don't get the permit, it's not happening. If you get the permit, then it's like okay, now I can book the flights, now I can start exercising or whatever. So, yeah. Well, thanks for attending. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. All right. Well, thank you so much, Barry and Jen. That was that was really wonderful. Thanks for watching this Minnesota Rovers presentation. If you want to see more, please click on the link to our channel or the subscribe button below. Thank you.